Hi, my name is Stephen Haunts from Pluralsight. In this course, I'll be discussing how you as a developer can decide whether becoming a manager is the right career move for you. If you decide that it is the right move, then this course will help you plan your first 90 days as you transition into becoming a manager. There will come a time in your software development career where you have gone as far as you can as a developer and you're starting to try and determine what direction you want to go in. One direction you could go down is the architecture route. This is still a technical discipline which will suit you if you want to stay more hands-on with the system or enterprise architecture design. Another route you can take is into management, either as a lead developer who still codes but also manages people, or into a pure people and team management role where you no longer write code, more like a software development manager. At the time of writing this course, this is the position I currently hold within a large healthcare company in the UK. Previously to that, I was a lead developer at a financial services company where I split my time between coding and leading a team. The aim of this course is to help you first decide whether becoming a manager is right for you. You may not have made the switch yet, but you are considering your future options. If this describes you, then I hope this course helps you make the best decision to suit your own circumstances. A valid answer after watching this course could be that becoming a manager is not right for you, and that's fine. It would be better to decide that now than to make a decision that is not right for you further down the line. If you do decide that becoming a manager is the right direction for you, then this course will offer you lots of advice to help ease you into your new role. This course is split into four main sections. The first section talks about what it means to be a manager and a leader of a software development team. This section will try to help you decide whether becoming a manager is the right decision for you. I will also give you some personal examples from my own career that demonstrates the thought processes that I went through when trying to decide what career path I was going to take. Next, I'll talk about running teams from a manager's perspective. In this module, I discuss the different employment contract types and their pros and cons, hiring and firing, different developer archetypes and how they affect the team's balance, and team motivation and innovation. Next, I'll help you plan your first 90 days in your new role as a new manager. I will offer suggestions for the types of planning you should do, how you should execute these plans, and how you should interact with your team, stakeholders and customers. I've split the first 90 days down into three separate modules for each of the three months to make the material more accessible for you. I will cover subjects like gathering domain knowledge, getting to know your team, getting your manager's expectations, evaluating existing development practices, meeting and managing stakeholders, and planning and documenting the technical direction for your team. So far in this module, I've used the term managing and leading interchangeably. I've done this deliberately because you'll tend to do a mixture of managing and leading with your team. What I'll do now is define what a manager and a leader is, and then look at some examples of the differences between the two. As we reveal some of these differences, try to think about some of the situations where you'd act as a manager and a leader when running a software development team. First, let's take a look at a definition of a manager. Management in organisations is a function that coordinates the efforts of people to accomplish goals and objectives using available resources efficiently and effectively. Managers have a position of authority which is vested in them by the company they are working for, and their direct reports work for them and largely do as they are instructed. The management style is generally transactional in that the manager tells the team member what to do, and the team member does this because they are employed by the company to work for their manager. Managers are paid to get things done by their own boss, often within tight constraints of time and money. Managers then delegate some of this work down to their teams who possess different skills to get the work done. In a software development team, as well as working within time and cost constraints, a manager will also need to ensure that the development team maintains a level of quality in the systems they produce. This is normally a fine balancing act to play between achieving time, cost and quality, which is why you as a manager will want to be sure that you have a team of skilled developers who can write quality, well-tested code from the outset. If you are managing a team, then you generally want to run a happy ship where everyone gets on with their work and you deliver good quality systems. It is quite common for someone who is managing a team not to want to take many risks which could impact a delivery. Risks could come from many directions, including trying out new development techniques or technologies. Whilst this is beneficial to spread knowledge, I've worked with some managers who have tried to avoid it because the time it takes for a developer to learn a new area could impact a project's immediate delivery timescales. This may sound like crazy talk, but I have seen this used as an excuse a number of times now. As I mentioned previously, there is a fine balancing act to play between time, cost and quality, and as a manager you are responsible for helping the team make these decisions. Now let's take a look at the definition of a leader. 
Leadership could be described as a process of social influence in which one person can enlist the aid and support of others in the accomplishment of a common task. Leaders do not necessarily have to have direct reports, at least not when they are leading. Many organisational leaders do have direct reports though because they are also managers. But when a leader wants to lead, they have to give up formal authoritarian control because to lead is to have followers and following is always a voluntary activity. Telling people what to do does not inspire them to follow you. You have to appeal to them showing how following you will lead to their heart's desires. They must want to follow you enough to stop what they are doing and perhaps walk into danger in situations where they would not normally consider risking. Leaders with a strong charisma find it easier to attract people to their cause. As a part of their persuasion, they typically promise transformational benefits, such that their followers will not just receive extrinsic rewards, but will somehow become better people. Although many leaders have a charismatic style to some extent, this does not require a loud personality. Leaders are always good with people and like to give credit to others and take blame on themselves in certain situations. This is very effective at creating the loyalty that great leaders engender. Although leaders try to inspire people to follow them as opposed to being more directed task managers, this does not mean that leaders do not pay attention to these tasks. In fact, they are often very achievement focused. What they do realise, however, is the importance of infusing others to work towards their vision. Leaders tend to be more willing to take risks than managers in general, although leaders are not blind thrill seekers. When pursuing their vision, leaders consider it natural to encounter problems and hurdles that must be overcome along the way. They are therefore comfortable with risk and will see routes that others avoid as potential opportunities for advantage and will happily bend the rules in order to get things done.